This is a live broadcast from the Oceania exhibition at the Royal Academy of Arts in London. Good evening, or good morning if you're watching from Oceania. It's an epic undertaking that seeks to explore the art and culture of a region of the world that spans from New Guinea to the Marquesa Islands, from Hawaii to New Zealand, and that actually covers over a third of the world's surface, but which is obviously dominated by water. Oceania is many things, a continent, a region, and an idea. And the idea of trying to reflect the myriad number of objects and ideas in an exhibition is a difficult undertaking. But one that the curatorial team at the Royal Academy, with outside collaboration, I think has more than stepped up to the mark on. There are over 200 objects from public collections on display, some of which are familiar, many of which have never been seen in this country or indeed in Europe at all. So the exhibition will reframe, contextualise, recontextualise and present anew. And also, we want to be a forum for debate and ceremony and live performance. To which end, we've got a surprise lined up for you later in the broadcast. First though, let's meet the curators. Overseen or liaised by Adrian Locke at the Royal Academy, two world authorities on oceanic art and culture, Professor Nick Thomas, Director of the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge, and Peter Brunt from the University of Victoria in Wellington, both of whom I met earlier at the very opening of the show. Nick, Peter, you begin with the idea of journey and you take the viewer on a journey, but culturally it's obviously a very resonant thing for the region, isn't it? Yes, and maybe it's easiest to think through that by thinking about a particular genre, that of the canoe, the vessel. Canoes are hugely important in many different forms right across the region. They're for fishing, they're for warfare, they're for voyaging, they're for emigration. Oceania is unique as a region because it's the only part of the world that was settled by water through people making voyages, reaching islands and engaging subsequently with each other through voyaging. And those voyages have continued right up into the present. Some islanders face the prospect of forced migration as a way of coping with sea level change. The idea of how we map or understand the physical entity of Oceania is an extraordinary thing. I don't want to be over-reductive, but I'm going to be a little. These, what look like abstract sculptures, in some ways are ways of charting aspects of the region, but they're a bit more than that too, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, these are um, uh, so-called navigator charts, sometimes called stick charts from the Marshall Islands. They reflect a a navigator's understanding of the geography of, say, an archipelago, uh, with the position of particular islands in relationship to ocean swells and, and that kind of thing. They're actually teaching devices. They weren't taken on voyages by a navigator, but were used to instruct those who were learning about how to navigate and voyage. So a kind of mnemonic devices. They reflect a kind of knowledge that's actually in a navigator's mind. Now I look at those wonderful objects and think in a sense of my own journey through the exhibition now. You've made a very specific journey, but the objects are so nuanced and complicated and layered. Some are fragments, some are self-contained, some have been in museums in Europe and not seen for ages if ever. Others have come from Oceania itself. How did the idea from moving from journey to the other themes, how does that crystallise and, and, and what kind of journey is the view being taken on? One of the things we've been enormously concerned about is restoring the specific stories that many of these artefacts have. They are not examples of genres as much as the works of particular creative artists who were, often had very distinctive imaginations, often were innovative even when they were at producing apparently customary forms, and they're works that bear extraordinary stories, like the Ahu Ulumanu, the, the cloak brought by Kamehameha II, the Hawaiian king, intended as a gift for King George IV. Um, tragically, both the king and queen died when they arrived soon after their arrival in England from measles. The gift was never presented, but um, remained in England and has recently been reconnected with this extraordinary 
and tragic history of a Polynesian effort to build international alliances and constitute new social relationships. Another couple of examples of that in the exhibition, I think, and that one is the relationship between the Kaitaia carving and the Tahitian carving from the Cambridge Museum. And we saw that in the opening of the exhibition where the sense of an ancestral connection between Māori and Tahitian from Eastern Polynesia, where Māori originally came from, was expressed in the kind of um, fellowship and affinity that was shared between the Tahitians and Māori who were at the opening of the exhibition. They're not just museum pieces, they're, they're connected to the communities that they um, come from and, and, um, and they still matter to them. And that's also true of um, one of the iconic pieces in the exhibition, the carving of the tattooed woman that is the, the sort of poster image of the exhibition, which represents a founding ancestor of the people of Aitutaki in the Cook Islands. There's a story of journeying there from further east in Polynesia, from Tubuai uh, to Aitutaki. And that idea of objects journeying and the kind of stories that they continue to tell and the sense of connection that the people that they originated from still have with them, I think comes through in this exhibition and the way it's been supported by um, the communities who have come to bless these objects and to bless this exhibition. What you also do in a really interesting way is showcase and empower the position of contemporary art. You've included a range of contemporary artists who themselves have made connections back through history and across cultures. And that seems a very, very powerful presence in the exhibition. The exhibition's distinctive in that it, it really is a realm of dialogue. Peter and I have been involved in interpreting these objects, these genres, these histories, but these artists are all co-interpreters with us. This installation is made out of blue tarpaulin that you get from an average hardware store. We really like to make, use materials that are common in um, our homes, in our homes of our communities. Um, so if kind of nothing else, people can come in and recognise that material and then maybe that's like a bit of an in to this space. I'm very influenced by the art of Polynesia. As you can see in the works, um, I make reference to a lot of uh, gods that um, are actually in the Oceania exhibition. So for me that has been, you know, mind-boggling. Um, because for many years I have been looking at books and the imagery in books for me to kind of see them in the flesh kind of takes me back to when I started drawing these figures onto you know the landscape that you see here behind me. What's also interesting about the contemporary work is some of the affinity in terms of values and um, aesthetics and material between what the contemporary artists uh, are doing and some of the historical work in the exhibition. So for example, Fiona Partington's series of photographs of Pacific Islander heads that were cast in the 19th century. That was a project that came about after becoming aware that the head of one of her ancestors was in the Musée de l'Homme and just that instant of connection, of ancestral connection to an artefact in a museum that gave birth to this photographic project of photographing um, those documents of scientific um, 
endeavour uh, and completely changing the sense of their meaning and value where she's been able to recover a kind of spirit, uh, a sense of presence of wairua, of ancestral connection um, between the present and the past, a kind of sensibility that she has that I think is shared by the importance of ancestors that is present in so many works in the exhibition. You know the, a lot of these physical objects you've seen with them, some of them are from your museum, but they still change, don't they, when you bring them into this kind of context? The, they change profoundly, and um, I think it's um, a wonderful experience to recontextualise them in a context where we get a real sense of the aesthetic power, I mean, the brilliance of the imagination, the sheer skill and dexterity of the artists that produce things that were extraordinary in very, very different cultural, practical, performative settings, but are still extraordinary in this context. So things we've seen before are still a great surprise, and it's fantastic to walk around that set of surprises. And I think even um, for myself, as someone who is not of Islander descent, to, in a sense, perceive the, the personhood incarnated in many of those works in the gallery dedicated to gods and ancestors, the, the mana, the spiritual power, the presence of that group of figures is really quite palpable. Inimitable Nick Thomas and Peter Brandt there talking about the power of objects in recontextualization and also the importance of contemporary art in this ongoing story. Now, I'm joined by Megan Tamati Quinnell, who's curator of contemporary and modern art, indigenous and Maori at Te Papa, the great National Museum of New Zealand in Wellington. You, your collection owns this work. This is by Michael Parakofi. This is a contemporary work with all sorts of resonances. How is its power and how recontextualizes it for you in this exhibition? Well, I think it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition between the, the objects that sit here and, and Michael's piano. It's one of those works that can kind of sit in between. Um, that, I mean, I talked about uh, works that can kind of unsettle the line between customary and contemporary. And his work, um, because it's fully carved and because it kind of references some of those traditions also um, can sit in, a, it is a contemporary artwork and it's normally shown in a kind of a white cube gallery and it does all of that but it is very comfortable I think in a context like this. Give, give us its title and its origins and history. So the title of the piano is called He Kōrero Pūrāko Moti Awanui o Te Motu, Story of a New Zealand River. And it was conceived actually as one of the central, as the central sculpture in a larger project called On First Looking in Chapman's Homer, um, which had two other uh, bronze pianos, black bronze with giant bulls on their lids, bulls as in you know, the animal, the male, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the male cow, and, not uh, round object. And this fully carved Steinway concert grand. Um, Michael has done a number of pianos and has kind of an obsession with pianos. And it has some relationship to the, the novel that inspired the film. Absolutely, Jane Maunder's novel, um, Story of a New Zealand River. He did an, an earlier work called Story of a New Zealand River which is another piano and it's um, a black lacquer piano and it has called Fi Fi down the sides, but it's actually German sheet music, and it has arm lilies, but it doesn't, it's a non-playable piano. He always wanted to do a fully carved piano. For me, it kind of intersects with lots of different histories, um, Māori carving traditions, of course, the East Coast and Te Arawa, which were the main kind of carving traditions, but also, you know, there's a thing we call Māori Victoriana, where different carvers like Tini Waitere, who's in this project, and others, Jacob Heberly, uh, carved not only, um, you know, meeting houses and more kind of customary material, they also carved beds and furniture and uh, photo frames and, you know, they, they changed walking sticks and 
uh, things. So it kind of fits within that kind of tradition as well. It's very interesting because I first saw this as, as did a lot of the Western art world when it was presented at the Venice Biennale. And it was a very strong, powerful piece, but it does appear very differently here. I mean, obviously it has its own resonance and that, there's a pun intended because it literally plays more of which in a minute. But it's sitting in a, a section, it's in the journeying section. So there's a kind of fluidity and a flow there, but it's also a linking object, as you say, with, 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 with other objects in the exhibition. And he's interested in people like Duchamp, as well as looking back to various um, traditions, Maori traditions. I find him a very interesting artist, a kind of pivotal figure, really. Well, he's a really interesting artist and he is interested in Duchamp and so this in a way is also a ready-made because it was a piano that existed but it's kind of a made over ready-made he's kind of changed its meaning by fully carving it but then there's also as I said relationships all the patterns on it are uh, the puhuru which is the cool fai fai around the bottom and pawa um, they're all um, patterns that are related to water and to movement so in some ways you can see it as a waka. He was wanting to do things like uh, create the piano and create a link both between uh, our waterways in New Zealand and the waterways in Venice. He also was wanting to take something that was familiar, a piano that was invented in Italy, um, and, but reimagine it and take it back in a form that was quite different. And there's, a, there's colonial associations. There's, there's Jane Campion's movie, The Piano, which talked about pianos being brought to New Zealand because we were the back of the beyond, you know, we're the antipodes. That culture came from somewhere else. So Michael's also saying that actually we've taken your piano, we've reimagined it, and, you know, w Europe's no longer the centre for culture. You know, we are. You know, we've, 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 we've changed it, we've shifted the game. Having seen this exhibition, I think he has a point. Um, final point to you, mm -hmm. the, the, it is an object, a beautiful object, it reverberates and resonates, but it is also still a piano that can be played, so it has that performative aspect to it. Absolutely, it has a performative aspect, and um, I mean, there's a famous well, a quote from him that he said all the time, that sound could fill a space like no object could. And he loved that idea that, and he said when it was being played in Venice, that he felt like that everything else disappeared. The piano actually disappeared and it was just to do with the music. You know, performance has been something he's always kind of used within his practice. Um, there's a number of works, like I said, he kind of critiques his own practice. He also, you know, artist as performer. Um, he also looks at things like the, the, the role performance plays within the culture, Māori culture, because well, it's a very performative culture. It's very difficult to embody performance in an exhibition. We've done so here with various objects that have ceremonial uh, uh, importance and value and association. But I'm delighted to say we are going to have a performance now. In fact, we're going to have three performances by NAFA, a Samoan uh, performing arts collective based here in London. And so Michael Parakofi's piano will transcend itself and fill the galleries with sound. So let's hear that performance from Nafa. Thank you.
più sacro di mia magione presso elle che sposa e se dovrà don Silva 
trips he took with the goddess firm in mind aboard the endeavor trading for treasure they were often sailing blind the common and genteel did crew and joseph banks took a slave or two and you what would you do talk of a lost continent would this talk be true the experimental gentlemen had nothing better to do the world was 
in transition, all vying for position to be rulers of land and sea. Navigate, navigate, everybody navigate right across the sea. Navigate, navigate, I can't wait to navigate, we'll form an A to Z. Let's explore beyond our shores, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Navigate, navigate, everybody navigate, right across these uncharted seas. to Paya, and no chief was a hire on his home of Tahiti, excelling in the arts and sea charts. Cook said, come with me to Paya, charted east to west, with ancient skills that he knew best would lead them all safely. To Paya led the Englishmen through Waters thus unknown. Despite the countless miles sailed, he could always point towards home. Though Captain Cook was at the helm, this truly was to Pius' realm, and he shall be honored rightfully. Navigate, navigate to Pius, to navigate right across the sea. Navigate, navigate, without him to navigate, who knows where that be? A grand tour of possibility from Rapa Nui to Fiji. Navigate, navigate, to Paya to navigate, right across these uncharted seas. and took all they could find. The world was quickly filling up, but what was left behind? Upon arrival in Aotearoa, a scuffle did break out, and Cook's crew did a Maori. Of this there is no doubt. To Pia did diffuse all ill by using great linguistic skill. His knowledge of the greetings allowed for fruitful meetings. Talopa, Kiora, Kiorana, Aloha. Navigate, navigate, everybody navigate right across the sea. Navigate, navigate, I can't wait to navigate, we'll form an A to Z. Let's explore beyond our shores, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Navigate, navigate, everybody navigate right across these uncharted seas.